CIBHS. Welcome to the first Small County Fiscal TA webinar of this fiscal year. We're all very excited to get started on these monthly webinars again. Um, just a few couple of things as usual. You, you are all muted currently and um, Mike will be stopping uh, periodically to, to um, he'll be pausing for questions. Uh, two ways that you can ask a question. One is to type your question into the question box on the um, control panel that you should see. Um, the second one is to uh, click on the hand icon next to your name and that will let me know that you would like to speak and then I'll take you off mute and you'll be able to ask your question um, on the phone. Um, I am recording this webinar, so it will be available within the next couple of days if you want to go over it again, review it again, or uh, have any of your colleagues view it if they aren't able to do so today. Um, I think that's it. The next one of these will be on Monday, October 6th. Um, 3 to 4 p.m. and I'll be sending something out when the time gets a little closer. So I'm just going to turn it over to Mike. Great. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to cover what was discussed at last Thursday's um, September 4th Financial Services Committee. Um, and you can see there the list of topics that were covered in the meeting. So jumping right in with the drug uh, Medi-Cal update, which um, we're starting to spend more and more time on um, at CBHDA since it is now CBHDA rather than CMHDA. So uh, we received an update from the DHCS representative um, on a couple of different things. It, the first had to do with drug Medi-Cal services that are associated with a Medicare Advantage plan. And so these are um, services where the, the Medi-Cal beneficiary is enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and you're supposed to bill Medicare before billing Medi-Cal. And the representative from DHCS was, was not real clear, but it, they did express some concern that the claims are not being handled properly uh, by the state in the short dual Medi-Cal system. And so they were going to look into that and um, see, if, see if there are issues or, or what they need to do there. And again, remember on, on the mental health side, this is where um, you need a letter from the Medicare Advantage plan to exempt from having to build the Medicare Advantage plan or get denial before submitting to, to short dual Medi-Cal. Um, it sounds like uh, there may be the same thing on the drug Medi-Cal side, and they're having some issues with that. Um, we talked, or we were informed that the uh, fiscal year 14-15 contracts were supposed to be sent out either Friday of last week or at the latest today. Um, and those contracts, they, they cover both drug Medi-Cal and non-drug Medi-Cal services. Um, and some of the new things that are included in that contract are the, uh, the quarterly administrative cost claiming um, and supposedly the SAPD MOE requirements are also spelled out in the contract. Um, so counties need to uh, sign and return those contracts in order to get paid to receive the FFP um, for, the, for any of the services for 14-15. Um, apparently they are paying prior year claims, uh, but in order to get reimbursed for services in 1415, um, you need to submit uh, a signed contract to the state. They also indicated, um, well, a couple of things that, that are kind of tied to this. One is the fiscal SPA was approved for drug Medi-Cal, which allows for the quarterly administrative cost claiming. Um, and then they said that uh, the forms should be released soon with an, through an information notice uh, specifying how you'll be able to claim for your administrative costs. And remember previously these were reimbursed through your rates and now you'll be able to claim them probably, hopefully through a process similar to uh, short dual Medi-Cal administration and hopefully the forms look familiar or similar. 
Um, we had a brief update on the 1115 drug medical demonstration waiver, uh, basically just that the terms and conditions have been drafted and those are, um, you can see those on the, the State Department of Healthcare Services website. Um, but the fiscal provisions, which are, are important to all of us, have not been developed um, and those are still being discussed um, between CBHDA and the state. And so uh, there's definitely a lot more to come there. Um, the, we also talked a little bit about uh, some of the regulations that are being developed regarding physician diagnostic requirements and then using DSM versus ICD codes for billing. And DHCS apparently is working on a set of frequently asked questions or responses to frequently asked questions um, regarding both of those issues. Um, one thing with regard to the DSM versus ICD uh, billing codes, um, CBHDA is recommending don't convert yet because of the increased costs the counties would would incur um, that let, let's wait until um, it's actually uh, more of a CMS requirement and eventually have a, a crosswalk that DHCS can provide so that um, we can see how that looks. And, and probably one of the main things, and I think we emphasis, emphasize this all the time, is that uh, even though they're developing these frequently asked questions, um, and they're doing changes and all these other things, you definitely still want to continue to submit claims um, because uh, they're not going to, to change the timing because of um, these FAQs. And then uh, they updated us briefly on the cost report training. The 1314 cost report regional training is complete. Um, However, they are apparently having difficulty with the uh, the application, the paradox application for the cost report. And because of that, there may be a delay um, in the required submission date beyond November 1st. Um, but they're still trying to work through that and um, they probably have to get out the application uh, before they can decide what the due date is. So um, again, more to to come on that. So that was the drug medical update. Are there any questions? All right, moving on to the MHSA update. Um, so uh, hopefully you're all aware that you received a, a pretty hefty distribution in August. And um, hopefully you were also anticipating that because we've been talking about it for a while that there's a large annual adjustment uh, that was posted to the fund on July 1st um, that related to the 2012 tax year and that was distributed to you folks um, along with whatever uh, revenues were received in July and then less the amount that the state reserves for administration and so that uh, is why you receive such a large August distribution. Um, in terms of trying to track this for the rest of the fiscal year, um, it, it, because there are no changes in tax law at this point, uh, we would think it's going to pretty much um, approximate or slightly higher than uh, the monthly distributions that you received last year. Um, so you can try to kind of track that relative to your distributions last year on a monthly basis, um, not on a year-to-date basis, but look at each month. And uh, so hopefully it'll it'll somewhat track um, to that to give you a kind of measurement tool. Um, the the one thing though is that it it still is dependent on um, when individuals make personal decisions to pay estimated taxes. So it might not totally track exactly, but hopefully um, it'll be a little easier to track this year. DHCS also indicated that they intend to issue an information notice soon um, with those percentages by county. Again, they didn't change uh, from 13-14, so it's the exact same percentages um, for 14-15 as they were for 13-14, which actually is the same percentages for 12-13 uh, and 11-12 as well. So it's, it's been the same. Everybody gets the same share for a while here. 
the one thing that they did say was going to be different with this information notice, rather than just specifying the percentages, they're going to try to provide some guidance to each county on what your estimated 1415 distribution will be um, based on those percentages and based on their estimates of revenue. So um, we'll see what that looks like uh, when that comes out, and hopefully it'll be out soon. And then we talked a little bit about the revenue and expenditure report, um, really focusing on 1213, uh, but um, to focus on 1213, DHCS still has some things that they're working with on the 1112 submissions. And so they're in the process of analyzing those submissions at this point and trying to identify some of the issues that they have or, and I'm not sure what they're looking at in terms of issues. Um, whether it's uh, some things that kind of stick out at them where they would have wanted to have additional clarifying information, or I, I'm not sure. So, um, but apparently they're, they're going to go through and analyze these and develop or identify the issues and then try to um, resolve those through discussions with the counties um, so that the 1213 template can be developed. Um, they do anticipate issuing a report of the statewide expenditures here pretty soon uh, for 11-12 based on the reports, um, as well as then they intend to release the 12-13 template uh, probably around the end of October. Um, and the Oversight and Accountability Commission has already indicated that they want to provide input into what the, the template looks like. Um, and then it was, it was nice to the state was willing to, or at least asked, when counties would then want to be able to submit the 1213 template, assuming an October release date. And um, it sounded like the end of January um, would be uh, something they would consider rather than making it due the end of December, along with your um, regular Medi-Cal specialty mental health cost report. Uh, and they also said it is fairly, at this point, they anticipate it to be fairly similar to the 11-12 template, especially with the component pages. Um, but again, once they've gone through the 11-12 and analyzed those submissions, as well as received the input from OAC, that, that may change. Um, although again, I, I can't imagine the component pages themselves uh, changing that dramatically. So. Any questions on, on MHSA? There's a question. Um, did you say August payment included July distribution for MHSA? So the way it works is all the revenues that are deposited into the state mental health services fund um, in the prior month are then distributed on the 15th of the next month. So the August 15th distribution that you guys just received that was roughly 430 million statewide, it would have included everything that went into the fund um, in July. And in July, what goes into the fund is the annual adjustment as well as just the regular monthly collections. Um, and then also, uh, I forgot that they do reserve an amount for the entire uh, amount appropriated for state administration um, as well as any other they reserve amounts for, that weren't spent from prior fiscal years that they're still carrying over. So the August distribution was based on revenues received in July, um, less the amount uh, unspent and unreserved, well, less the amount reserved and spent. And just like September 15th distribution, the distribution coming up in a week will be everything that um, all the revenues that went into the fund in August, uh, less anything that was spent or reserved for administration. But the, the one unique thing, and, and this will always be the case, is that the August distribution always will include the annual adjustment amount, which hopefully will continue to be fairly large. So your, your August distribution should always be fairly large. All right, um, moving on to the short Doyle modernization project update. Um, so the, uh, actually it's not CMHDA, it's CBHDA. Um, 
Cal, Mesa, and, and DHCS are drafting a um, project management plan uh, for this short oil modernization update project. Um, that project management plan will go to the governance committee um, who is meeting the end of September. Hopefully it will be approved at that point and then we'll get to see what it looks like um, and can provide some input into that uh, project management plan. And really there's, um, there's two pieces to this. Uh, and this uh, one is looking at basically shoring up the Short Doyle 2 system. So the Short Doyle 2 enhancement recommendations and um, basically how to keep Short Doyle 2 operational um, until we get to a, a new uh, federal payment system. And then there's also the federal payment pilot um, where we'll look at uh, more than likely a, a capitated sort of payment system and um, how uh, existing data, both financial and uh, claims, can be used to support uh, a capitated or development of capitation rates, which are um, payment rates that are based on the actual Medi-Cal enrollment in a given county. And typically, they vary um, by different factors, such as the aid codes, uh, age, and sex um, of the enrollees. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a look at that and uh, start to look at some data there. We'll definitely know more, I think, on all of this. Um, one, once the, uh, the governance committee has a chance to review the project management plan, but then more than likely um, this will be discussed at the CBHDA um, governing board uh, meeting in November. Um, and so hopefully at that point uh, we'll get the go-ahead to to proceed with um, pursuing uh, the federal payment pilot and looking towards capitation. And, and more than likely, too, um, that'll also involve intergovernmental transfers where you'll have to transfer funds to the state in order to get, um, get the capitation payment back. And so depending on the aid code uh, and the, the percentage of federal reimbursement would depend on how much you would have to, to transfer in, in terms of an intergovernmental transfer. The, the other thing on capitation um, is more than likely, uh, at least initially, um, each county mental health plan would probably have their own sets of rates, although again this is something we would look at um, just because of the diverse nature in, in terms of spending on the Medi-Cal population that you all have. Um, eventually those would probably have to be somewhat normalized, um, but at least out of the gate I think we could hopefully propose everybody have their own set of rates so that nobody is disadvantaged uh, by moving to a capitated system. Um, and then the other thing on this is, uh, like I said, we'll probably know more in November. Um, and I think at this point, um, the uh, CIBHS, which used to be CIMH, um, is intending to do a, a another um, fiscal institute uh, in the first part of December, and so we probably talk about this in a lot more detail at that at that point. So that was it on the short door modernization update. Um, and actually, we didn't even talk about it that much, but uh, just to give you a little bit more. So, anybody questions on that stuff? I have a question. Is there discussion of moving to capitated payments for substance use disorder as well, or just mental health to start? I, I think. Um, I think long term it's both. I think it's a behavioral health uh, capitated payment probably in the form of a carve out. Um, but it, this is specifically talking about mental health. Um, if assuming that the drug Medi-Cal 1115 waiver goes forward, um, and again the fiscal provisions have not been drafted on that, uh, but hopefully one of the options for you, because that is a voluntary opt-in waiver, uh, one of the options would be to get reimbursed on a capitated basis for drug Medi-Cal. Um, so it would give a chance to, to kind of test that out. Um, but I, I, I think long-term it, it probably is both. It's just a matter of what, what is long-term. Is that five years, six years, something like that? 
while the short term is more like in the next year and a half, two years. Um, and, and that shorter term, I think, will just be mental health. All right. Moving on to short dwell two update. Um, talked a little bit about KDA implementation and, and a couple of different issues here. Um, one is the the report that the state is issuing on a monthly basis, um, and they indicated they now have to go through what they're calling a privacy review on the report. And apparently, what this means is if there are less than 11 clients. Um, in the data set. They cannot report it on a statewide report, public report, um, with the, uh, the rationale, and this is probably somewhere in some rules or regulations within the state, um, that the thought is that if there are that few of people that somehow you could connect the blocks and actually get uh, personal health information um, through the internet or, or however. So, uh, the state has said that if there are less than 11 clients, they're not going to report that out on the report. However, they are putting, uh, I guess, an asterisk by the county, and then at the bottom it does say that the data has been redacted um, because of the few number of clients. Um, the, the other thing uh, is if you've got better information um, than what you're seeing on that report, if you're seeing anything, uh, you should let uh, CBHDA or probably MedCC would be a better choice. Um, let them know that you've got a local report that shows more services or additional services that is more accurate than what the state's showing. And to deal with this issue on the privacy report and, and to make sure that um, the state does have your data, it, it sounds like they may look at using uh, you know the portal at, at ITWS. Um, to report back to you what they're seeing or or what um, they're yeah showing is being submitted. So um, I guess more to come on that one. And then we talked a little bit about the quarterly administrative claiming for KDA, um, and it it sounds like so what this represents is there the state appropriated some general fund monies, some state general fund monies this year uh, to offset the county's costs of um, preparing the, the KDA quarterly progress reports. Um, and so they're looking at modifying the administrative claiming forms, the 1982B and 1982C, um, to allow you to report your costs on that form. It probably would also require a modification on the cost report since uh, rather than just FFP, this would be FFP plus state general fund, so full reimbursement of your cost associated with um, the quarterly administrating claiming. Um, the Department of Finance needs to approve whatever process DHCS proposes, so um, that still needs to get accomplished. Uh, but they did say they anticipate the forms being published in October so that you can use them for the first, the claim for the first quarter of fiscal year 14-15 and, and include um, your KDA uh, administrative costs associated with the quarterly progress reports. One thing to be aware of um, is that social services also received money uh, for the um, to cover their costs of doing the quarterly progress reporting. So you want to make sure that you aren't um, billing both places. So you, won't, you don't want to be picking up your social services costs associated with these quarterly progress reports because they should have a mechanism um, to claim those through the Department of Social Services at the state. So I think that was it on KDA. Any any questions there? All right. Um, and then we spent quite a bit of time talking about this adjudication of claims with multiple aid codes. And, and so when you have a, a Medi-Cal beneficiary um, who may have multiple aid codes. Apparently some of those are, we're not sure how many um, of the claims are, are being either outright denied or potentially reimbursed at the lower uh, aid code amount. So, you know, some aid codes, most aid codes are 
reimbursed, but some are 65 percent, and then some are 100 percent, especially on the newly eligibles. Um, so it sounds like the short dwell two system itself has difficulty handling um, claims that have a multiple aid code. So uh, that was brought to DHCS's attention, I believe, a while ago, and they now have developed a plan um, for addressing the issue. Um, they're going to work with each county to try to identify the the scope of the issue, and that I'm imagining that they're going to start with some of the larger counties just to find out is this really that big of a deal, um, because it it might not be, uh, and hopefully it's not, but but we don't know at this point. Um, so for anybody um, who's looked at this and has identified it as an issue, you can reference if you, if you email MedCCC. You can reference that ticket number there, 378756, um, and so they'll know it's associated with this issue. I mean, ultimately what DHS is trying to do is to, to verify and validate the claims that they are, um, you know, a, they should be adjudicated and approved claims. Obviously, the biggest thing that we're concerned, um, or one of the things that we're concerned about, is the whole audit settlement issue where you know, the auditors um, take the lower of your data or their data and um, making sure that these claims end up in the the state auditor's data. So um, and the policy folks, it sounds like, have met with the audit folks, and so hopefully they're figuring out how to work through that issue. Um, but if, if you're, because this can go back quite a ways, um, but if you're uh, if you have claims where you've identified this and the audit is still open, uh, I think you're supposed to request to include the claims as part of the audit. Now, if the audit has already been finalized, then apparently you have to address this through the appeals process, through the audit appeals process. Um, but again, I you know I think there's a lot more still to come on this, um, and and to see if it's even a big issue because hopefully it's not. Uh, they did say they're willing to look at data from all sources, which again is kind of different than what we've heard from auditors um, in the past. Uh, they said they're willing to run reports. If you don't have the data, they'll run it for you. Um, they had a list of counties that have already identified claims, um, and it you know was was brought up that small counties really don't have the resources to be researching this. Um, and so it, it's definitely a small county uh, concern that um, that this get addressed. And so again, I think the state needs to figure out the scope of the issue, and then uh, we can kind of react and see if it's something that that small counties um, are going to have to put some resources towards. Uh, it, it was interesting to hear the state say they might not have accurate paid claims data. Again, I'm not sure how that's going to translate in an audit. Um, they said they will. They're in the process of identifying a communication strategy um, on how to keep people informed of what's going on with this. And then lastly, they, they are going to put a system change to fix the problem, but it sounds like it's, it's at least two months away. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be, it, in, to the extent that it's occurring and, and continuing to occur, then it, it will become a bigger and bigger problem. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it's not a big issue right now, and this isn't really happening for a significant number of claims. But um, we'll just have to to kind of wait and see how it how it goes as they look at the data. The other thing is we talked um, as part of this, the the CBHDA uh, SWAT folks are um, you know identified or are working with DHCS on this. Um, if and apparently, uh, Dan Walters out of Kern County, uh, who heads that, puts out pretty detailed notes on their um, weekly Thursday calls. So if you want to get on that distribution list so you can kind of see what is being discussed um, in more detail, uh, go ahead and, and um, email Don Kingdon at, at CBHDA um, to get on the SWAT distribution list, and, and he'll uh, connect you with Dan, and, and you can get more detailed information on this um, as the, the whole process moves forward. 
So that's the adjudication of claims with multiple aid codes. Anybody have any questions? All right. Um, moving on to the claims payment update, which um, was pretty brief. Uh, they're still working on a couple of um, years of cost settlements, cost report settlements, and these are the interim settlements. Um, so for 910, uh, and this I, I think is the same as what it was, what, three months ago, uh, there's still nine counties, I believe, that are outstanding um, that have not completed the reconciliation process, and DHS is working with those folks to get their 910 cost reports uh, cleaned up and accurate. Um, so they can go ahead and do the reconciliation. And then um, for 1011, uh, the majority of you hopefully have received letters by now to go ahead and begin the reconciliation process, and hopefully you're in that process. Um, yeah, we didn't talk about 1112, but I, I would think that'll be somewhat soon here, um, too, is... is uh, as there's been enough time for those claims to, to get through the system by now. Um, and then we're still waiting on this electronic funds transfer process. Um, they're still in testing, and they're saying it's going to be another four to six weeks um, while they run through all the different tests between the state controller's office and the whatever, I think it's the USL financial system to, to see how it works. So that was it on the claims payment. Any questions? All right. Then we talked a little bit about um, the behavioral health sub-account. Uh, and so we're, we're waiting on the 1415 allocation percentages. Um, and those will be effective at the end of this month with the distribution that's at the end of this month. Uh, CBHDA had submitted recommendations to CSAC for 1415 and then CSAC needs to submit those to DHCS and we weren't sure if, if that had actually occurred uh, but the recommendation was that the state um, stabilize the base using uh, the percentages from last year as the starting point with with two changes to the drug medical side one would be to switch over from um, drug Medi-Cal uh, County of Service to the County of Beneficiary, um, more similar to what we have on the Medi-Cal Specialty Mental Health side, um, and then also uh, to provide a $100,000 minimum drug Medi-Cal base for all counties. So, um, and I believe uh, when we looked at it by County of Service, that would have impacted um, about 17 of, of you small counties. Um, we should hopefully have data by county beneficiary this maybe this week uh, to look at what that would look like um, on a county beneficiary basis. So those were the recommendations. Um, uh, also, on in terms of some of the the recommendations regarding growth, um, you know we realize that that the Medi-Cal entitlement programs will get priority with the growth, uh, and DHS has made that very clear that. That that's one of their priorities. Um, but once that has been met, um, that we start to look at, or the state look at, uh, the beneficiaries, utilization, beneficiary access, things along those lines um, to allocate the additional growth um, so that we, we start to consider other factors rather than just expenditures um, with the allocation of growth. Like I said, uh, DHCS has to have this done by September 22nd, so the end of this month, um, because it, uh, whatever percentages they provide will be used for the behavioral health subaccount allocation at the end of this month. Um, so it's effective with the September 2014 distributions. And we really didn't, uh, the state didn't really tell us what they're thinking in terms of, of how they were looking at the percentages. Um, and I, I'm not surprised. I, I don't think they probably can at this point. So any, any questions on, on the behavioral health sub-account allocation percentages? Uh, what are the Medi-Cal entitlement programs? So the, the state considers the, with, within the behavioral health sub-account, that the EPSDT program, 
and the drug Medi-Cal program are, are their two priorities. I think you could easily argue that the managed care, um, which is the other part of this, uh, should also be factored into that um, because it's part of the Medi-Cal program as well. And so really the only thing in the behavioral health sub-account that isn't um, a Medi-Cal entitlement program would be all the uh, substance use disorder uh, funds that for non-drug Medi-Cal services. All right, moving right along to the work group update. There's another question, okay. sorry. Was there any information on whether the backup to the allocation schedule will be issued when the allocation schedule something? <laughs> Last year, the yeah, backup so, allocation, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the one thing that we didn't hear is whether they're, so they're going to develop these allocation schedules but they didn't say whether they were going to issue an information notice or, or what the timing was. Um, and so it might just be that we get the percentages or we, we might not get anything. We might just get the money. Um, and then you can back into what your percentage is. Um, because you'll remember uh, for 12-13, I, I believe they were fairly decent and, and provided the backup prior to the start of the fiscal year. For last year, for 13-14, we didn't see that until, I believe, May. Um, so we're almost done with the fiscal year before they provided how they came up with those percentages. Um, so I, at this point, I, I have no idea if they're going to issue an information notice with the backup um, that shows how they calculated um, the allocation percentages or if they're just going to provide a letter to the state controller's office saying here are the allocation percentages, um, which to be honest with you, I'm guessing it's probably more the latter that we're just going to see the percentages. We may get some sort of verbal um, explanation as to why there are differences between 14-15 and 13-14, um, but I, I would bet we're not going to see an info notice with the backup for a while because um, because of a whole host of reasons. One, the, the political nature of this. Secondly, it, it seems to take uh, the state forever to get out an information notice anyway. Um, and so unless they've already developed what those allocations are in the data, um, which, which would mean they're basically going to disregard uh, CBHDA's recommendation. Um, so I, 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 I can say I don't know. But I, I think it's highly unlikely that we would see an information notice um, any time in the in the next month, you know. So, which is unfortunate because, especially um, if you're relying on that information to figure out how much of the distributions you want to put to substance use disorder versus mental health, um, and you know, we you basically have to rely on on what they've issued previously. That was a good question. All right, going into the work group updates. Um, again, there, there's not really anything new uh, here. Um, the uh, We're waiting for the state plan amendment uh, to get submitted officially. Um, and the only reason it hasn't been submitted officially is because we brought up this issue that we don't believe um, counties or, or government operated providers should be subject uh, to a customary charge limitation um, by the very nature of, of what you guys do. And CMS did not agree with that, um, but at least DHCS agrees with us. And so they're putting forth an argument as to why, um, why we should be uh, not have to look at charges. And so we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, CMS, after seeing the argument, may say, okay, that makes sense and, and agree to it. And then, in which case, um, it, it shouldn't uh, be that difficult for CMS to approve the SMA, SPA, um, which DHCS is going to apparently officially submit in October. Um, so once uh, DHCS submits the SPA formally, 
uh, CMS has, I believe it's 90 days um, to review and, and either approve it or deny it. Um, and so we'll we'll know um, what November December maybe by the end of January um, whether it's going to be approved. Uh, once it is approved, um, then it because the other one of the key provisions of this SPA is the supplemental payment program, and so uh, it allows you to get reimbursed your costs in excess of um, what you were reimbursed. Uh, under the the cost report system, so th there's a couple of pieces to this. One is, assuming you know, if you had cost above the SMA and you were held to SMA, then uh, you would get reimbursed. You would get FFP based on your actual costs. The other thing is, if you had charges that were lower than um, your costs, uh, and this spa takes out the whole concept of having to apply charges. Um, you, you could actually get more reimbursement there, even if you were below the SMA or uh, with your actual costs. So um, there, there's, you know, I don't know if it's going to be huge money, uh, but for small counties, but it, it definitely is something that'll be nice to get approved and to get some potential additional reimbursement for your actual costs over and above what um, what you were paid. And remember, this goes back to January 1st, 2009. Um, so, uh, and a lot of you either are in the process or have gone through the process of being audited for 8-9. Um, and so that audited cost report uh, would serve as the basis for probably the supplemental claim for 8-9. Um, and then the interim uh, settled cost report would be used for 9-10. Um, 10, 11, um, and then when they go to settle 11, 12, hopefully this year, you'd be able to uh, submit a supplemental claim for 11, 12. So um, more to come on that, uh, but we'll hopefully know within the next you know four or five months what's what's going to go on with that and what specifically is going to happen with respect to um, government operated providers and the charge structure and whether that needs to be a limit or not. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, and then we got into the other fiscal issues. So this is when we got into the county to county discussions. Um, again, talking a little bit about the 1115 drug Medi-Cal waiver. Um, the uh, the the terms and conditions really spell out the new coverage and some of the issues there. Um, there are still on the on the fiscal side um, some things that are being discussed. The you know the the rate structure, um, whether the IMD exclusion would apply. Um, but and so CBHCA is working with DHS on the this concept of budget neutrality, which is what the feds what CMS really looks at with a waiver is um, whether the costs under the waiver are equal to or less than what would have been paid without the waiver. Um, and so for drug Medi-Cal, what that means is looking at historically over the past five years, what has been spent, and then what are the additional services. And so th there may not be a ton of room under that budget neutrality number um, to do some of the other things like an increase in rates or the IMD exclusion. Um, we talked a little bit about KDA administrative claiming, and, and again, these it, it is specific to the costs incurred in preparing the quarterly uh, progress report. But make sure that includes, um, you know, all your reprogramming costs of your short level two system uh, to be able to identify and track these services. Um, and you know, you want to pr try to get as, as many costs as possible identified. Uh, with that uh, that new reporting requirement, with the one thing that you you don't want to include uh, any of social services costs because again they've got a separate process to to get reimbursed for their additional costs. And then if you remember in 1112 um, through AB 100, uh, the 1112 EPSDT uh, amounts, the formerly state general fund that were funded with MHSA that year 
were done through allocations. Um, and when that was all said and done, there's about eight million uh, that were overpaid to some counties and underpaid to others that needs to go back and forth between those counties. And, and we're waiting on Riverside um, to get resolution on an issue um, in terms of how the state is looking at their EPSDT costs. Uh, and once that's done, then um, we'll probably, CBHDA will try to facilitate the exchange of funds between folks on the 11-12 amounts. And then um, in terms of the audit resources, or, or really it was more like talking about how can we start to centralize and, and uh, learn from each other on what's going on. And um, CBHDA is going to be uh, collecting audit appeal summaries um, from each of you. And so then we can we'll put that together and, and take a look at it, um, probably discuss it at the next meeting. Maybe not the next one, which I think is a joint financial services IT, but for sure the one after. Um, and really looking at, because some of the major issues that I think we all deal with have a, are around supporting our Medi-Cal units of service, uh, how the auditors look at allocations of administrative and administration and utilization review, how the state's treating indirect costs. Um, and and it, we may find it, it's actually, I'm going to guess we're going to find it's being done differently by different auditors. Um, and so probably take a look at putting this together, discuss with some higher ups at DHCS to see if we can't get more consistency um, from the auditors. And if that doesn't work, then uh, you know maybe pursue some some legal options at that point. Um, so uh, because the other thing is even when we talk about going to capitation, if if you think about it, it's not going to happen this year. It's probably not going to happen next year. So maybe 16. 17, um, it means we're still going to be dealing with audits through 15, 16. And those audits will be in the year 2021. So um, to the extent we can uh, make that whole audit process more consistent and um, more rational, that would, would be great. Um, we talked a little bit about the drug Medi-Cal rates, you know, um, where they've been low and, and then um, really, uh, the bottom line is because, especially now with um, there being some state general fund involved with the rates, which is why they've been kept low, but now with the expanded benefit and additional state general fund uh, in the rates, we don't see those probably increasing, um, which, which is too bad. And then we talked a little bit about the use of the SAPTI funds. Um, and really, and it, there's two parts to this. One is, as part of the 1115 waiver, um, it sounds like DHCS is looking to repurpose the SAPD, uh block grant potentially. Um, and we're not sure what that really means. Uh, and it also feeds into the extent that you're using SAPD funds to cover services that could have been paid for by Drug Medi-Cal, um, but you use SAPD instead because it was a lot easier. Um, then it, when we do the budget neutrality that I talked about, it makes it look like the costs are a lot less in the drug Medi-Cal program than they really are. So CBHDA wants to um, try to figure out what, what's the scope of this issue. Is it really a big issue? Um, and so there were some counties that volunteered uh, to, to work with CBHDA to take a closer look at what they're doing. And we'll see what the results of that, um, that those discussions are and see if we can't extrapolate then something to, to the state as a whole to try to get an idea of the use of SAPD or the, the SAPD MOE funds through the behavioral health sub-account, the extent of those being used for drug Medi-Cal services that aren't actually being then claimed through drug Medi-Cal. So that was it. Were there any questions on any of those issues? Um, what did you say not to include in KDA admin claiming? Uh, primarily anything, any of the administrative costs incurred by your social services uh, department um, because they'll have a separate uh, methodology or approach to get reimbursed through the State Department of Social Services. 
Um, so you don't want to double, you don't want to claim costs on both through DHCS and through DSS. Um, but uh, you know, definitely load in all your mental health costs um, incurred in preparing the quarterly progress report, including any probably some of the bigger ones are going to be associated with um, reprogramming your system, paying your vendors to to put in the indicators and and all that sort of stuff that you can then use to generate your um, the quarterly progress reports. I, I would imagine DHCS is going to come out with an info notice on it, um, along with once they uh, change the forms, um, and we'll see if it's it's actually any. It may be narrower than that, but at this point, that's how I would consider it. But but you wouldn't want to include social services costs because they should be claimed through Department of Social Services. All right. So just one more can, one more thing, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> can you briefly restate the ICD-10 recommendations? I, I think the recommendation because I'm not super familiar with this, um, but I thought the I think the issue is don't uh, require all these changes at this point because we're going to have changes um, down the line with the new ICD codes. Um, so wait until that point to to really make any system changes. Um, but that that's about all I can guess at this point. And, and we didn't get into a ton of detail on that either. And I was uh, just going to update you guys real quickly on revenues. Um, and some of you probably already know this, uh, but for 1314, sales tax came in higher than expected. Um, so what that means, since two of our um, Two of our revenue sources are, are primarily sales tax. It's a positive thing. So we anticipate more growth in the 2011 behavioral health sub account for 1314. Um, it'll probably be closer to 60 million versus the 40 million that we uh, had previously estimated. So that's a good thing. The only downside is we don't know how the state's going to put that out um, and what data they'll use. The other thing is remember that 5% of um, the growth in the 2011 account goes to the 91 account. Doesn't increase the base, but it is kind of a one-time distribution. Uh, that's going to be a little bit higher. It'll probably be closer to 9 million versus the 6 million that had been estimated. Um, and if you go back, you can look at how much you received in April for the 12-13 fiscal year and probably anticipate about 10% less than that amount. And hopefully that won't that'll come out a lot sooner than April. Hopefully they'll get it out this calendar year. And then the last thing is um, it looks like the CalWorks MOE swap um, is going to equal how much we're receiving already in '91 realignment, and that we're actually going to see a little bit of growth in our 1991 realignment in 1314. Uh, this is all predicated on the caseload costs once they get the actuals on that. But assuming the budget comes in pretty close, to, or actuals come in pretty close to budget, um, we're probably looking at a, a 10 to 20 million dollar increase in our 91 um, base in the current year. So 14, 15 um, would be slightly higher. It'd be about 1% higher than what you received last year. In addition, you would get the growth check for. 13, 14. Um, so uh, again, pretty positive news on, on the revenue side. That in addition to the huge amount of funding that you got in MHSA in August, um, and it looks like a fairly decent revenue year uh, that we're starting out with. So I know we're a little bit early. Any other questions on any other issues? Shoshani, you seeing anything out there, or, or should we just wrap it up? Nothing new. So. Okay. Well, we're a couple minutes early. Um, 
but uh, yeah, we'll um, like I said next. I think next month is a financial services IT committee joint meeting, and um, we'll report out on that. Uh, you know, the the first part of October. So, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye bye. Bye.